Good evening, folks. Welcome along to the second episode of this series of Full School. Uh, just before we get started, I'd like to ask once again that if you can, please support our local craft brewers who have turned their brew houses into soup kitchens. Um, I'll pop a link down in the comments below during this uh, chat so you can follow along for that one. Um, our guest today requires very little introduction to anyone familiar with folks, home brewing. Sorry about that. Um, but Trevor is going to attempt to introduce him anyway. So, yeah, over to you, Trevor. Are you ready? I'm getting a lot of feedback, Mike. So, I just, uh, sorry about that. I just want to shut down my. So I just want to say, I mean, as, uh, as you've said, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, John, for showing the generosity, uh, as did Brad uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, no one needs to give any introduction to John Palmer. Uh, I, I once came up to you when you appeared in South Africa as part of the beer boot camp that, uh, John, uh, that uh, Julian and, and uh, Wendy Pinar run in this country. And I came up to you with my book and you put in the front there, to Trevor, Brew unto others as you would have them brew unto you. And I think uh, that's a fantastic summing up of the, of the beer ethos uh, around the world. And, and, and thank you very much for your time here. There will be time for some questions. So I keep firing them off on the YouTube link. Thanks a lot. My pleasure to be here. Um, well, um, let's see. Are we going to get started or... Should yeah, I, let's yeah, get started. Start um, again. We'll share your screen there. Okay, I'll go ahead and start that up again. Um, let's see. Yes, there we go. Share. Okay, can you all see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Um, I, I hope you don't mind hearing about water yet again, uh, but many say that the third time's the charm. So, um, this is a presentation I gave uh, just last week to the uh, Pittsburgh district here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> I am the editor in chief for the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. And that means that I work on the technical quarterly, uh, our journal, as well as editing and fielding manuscripts for uh, uh, books uh, from our members. If you're not familiar with Master Brewers Association, it is uh, a professional organization, much like the Journal of Institute or the Institute of Brewing and Distilling, um, and uh, the American Association of uh, Brewing Chemists, um, and uh, similar organizations. Um, the MBAA is focused on the practical aspects of, of running a brewery, you know. Uh, being a brewmaster and uh, uh, operations and such. So uh, you may be interested in, in joining as an individual. Um, I believe there is a South African district, uh, could be wrong here, but um, it, is, it is open uh, to worldwide membership and it gives you access to lots and lots of uh, archived journal, uh, journals and uh, presentations. So anyway, Thank you, and here we go. So why do we adjust brewing water? Well, we do it to improve our beer yield, and, to, and what I mean by that is to hit our target mash pH. Um, this is a detail that I added just this morning because uh, it, is, it is the real uh, target or the real reason that we adjust brewing water is to help hit our target mash pH. And I'll explain as we go along how important that is um, to the overall success of the process. But we do it to improve our beer yield. We do it to improve our beer flavor. And in doing so, we also are able to prevent carbonate scale on our equipment. What do we adjust? We adjust the mineral composition of the water. How do we adjust it? We do it by salt additions, acid additions, and ion removal processes, such as reverse osmosis. When do we adjust it? Well, 
I love this quote. The key point for control of pH throughout the brewing process is during mashing. This is due to the major influence that can be exerted at this stage on the content and format of the buffer systems that will operate subsequently in the wort and beer. Okay, very concise message. Uh, you know, this is exactly how we as brewers are able to affect the flavor and quality of our beer and it starts in the mash. Okay, step one, know your source water. Are you brewing with a surface water source or a groundwater source? These two sources generally have opposite uh, properties. Surface water, lakes, rivers, streams, precipitation uh, in reservoirs, often low in minerals, but high in organic matter. Uh, organic matter, I mean things like algae, uh, dead leaves, dead frogs, etc. These odors and flavors often require carbon filtration to remove them. Now, groundwater sources, on the other hand, are often port potable. They are often you know, able to be you know, drank right out of the ground. Uh, these are usually high in minerals and low in organics. Um, but from a brewer's point of view, uh, the, the alkalinity usually needs to be reduced to make it uh, useful for us. It is also important to know how your source water is disinfected, whether it's done with chlorine or chloramine, okay? And it's important to understand if your source changes throughout the year. Does it change seasonally? Does it change monthly, depending on where water is available from? Uh, here in California, um, we, our, our water sources can change weekly, depending on where it is most available from and prices and so on. So um, it's important to understand and test your water and because uh, that, that is the basis for adjusting it. Now then, there are two groups of ions in the water. There are those that affect pH, and this is your calcium, magnesium, and total alkalinity. Total alkalinity is primarily composed of bicarbonate but it is the carbonate species of ions, uh, carbonate, bicarbonate, and dissolved carbon dioxide that affect your total alkalinity. Then we have the ions that, are, uh, only, that do not affect pH, but only affect flavor. And this is sulfate, chloride, and sodium. Now these six ions, and to, again, total alkalinity is primarily bicarbonate. These six ions represent 99% of the total dissolved solids in the water, okay? That's why I only talk about these six. Yes, there will be others. There'll be trace amounts of chromium and zinc and iron and manganese and this, that, and the other thing, as well as organic contaminants. But in terms of percent by weight um, and even percent, you know, atomic percent, uh, they, uh, those are usually less than 1% of the total. Okay. Mineral concentrations. Zero to 50 ppm is a low concentration. Generally, we say that 50 ppm is the minimum for an ion to have and a, a, a discernible, a significant effect either on the pH or the flavor of the water and then the flavor of the beer, okay? So if it's zero to 50 is low. Anything less than 20 ppms is really low. It's not even worth worrying about. 50 to 100 is medium, 100 to 150 is high, and over 150 ppm, those are usually a problem. And very often brewers have to, uh, put up with water and, and fix water that has an alkalinity of greater than 150 ppm. Um, here is my water adjustment app. This is available on the Apple Store and the Google Play Store. It's called Palmer's Brewing Water Adjustment App. You know, I could have called it, you know, Zorro 3000 or something, but I think this is a little more descriptive. Um, and it works just like my brewing water uh, spreadsheet, 
in that you select a style of beer that you're trying to brew, you input your source water data, you choose a target residual alkalinity and the volume of water that you intend to adjust, and then it guides you through steps such as uh, optional dilution with distilled water, uh, salt additions, acid additions. It, it, it uh, estimates an, uh, or suggested acid additions for you and then lets you put in the amount you actually use and then gives you the results in step seven. And here's an example of step seven where uh, you have the recommendation for the style of beer that you're brewing um, and what your final tallies are in terms of after adjustment. So you can see how you come out. Very useful little app, it's free um, and it's out there. Okay, so how does water affect beer flavor? Well, water residual alkalinity drives the mash pH uh, and work pH. The mash pH drives the beer pH and beer pH drives beer flavor expression. Um, this is usually where I talk about my spaghetti sauce example. You know, if you make spaghetti sauce, you know, or buy spaghetti sauce from the grocery store, it's a very sweet, uh, high pH sauce. It's very smooth. Um, it's not, but you know, the kids love it, but it's not very interesting for adults. Whereas if you go to the local paleo, uh, organic Italian restaurant where they've, you know, picked the fresh pick the tomatoes that morning and gently squeezed them into the pot by nuns, um, you get a very bright acidic tomato sauce that uh, etches, you can feel it etching your teeth from the acidity, but it's not very complex. It's very one dimensional. This is the same way with your beer. The, the pH of the beer drives how those flavors are expressed to your palate. So we want to find the pH of the beer that best expresses all of the flavors of the beer. And I'll talk more about this later. Okay, uh, second, we have the seasoning balance. This is the sulfate and chloride ratio. More sulfate tends to dry out the character of the beer, makes the hop character more assertive more chloride rounds out and sweetens the malt character of the beer. Um, and uh, yeah, so more sulfate drier, more chloride, a little rounder, fuller and sweeter. Then you have the seasoning level, that is the, the total amounts of sulfate and chloride in the, in the beer, not just the ratio. And um, this is in other words, like the total dissolved solids, but it is also proportional your, to your calcium salt additions because we are going to be adding calcium salts to pump up the calcium level and add this sulfate and add this chloride. Okay, those are the three ways that water affects beer flavor. The water pH is not important, okay? I want to emphasize this over and over again. Water pH is not important. Do not adjust your water based on its pH. You can do it based on its alkalinity and mineral composition, but don't do it on, based on pH. Um, water pH is, a pH is a measure of chemical activity and chemical equilibrium, okay? And in the case of water, it is essentially the balance between hardness that is calcium and magnesium, and alkalinity, the bicarbonates and carbonates. So it's, it's a measure of that balance between the two. And generally, there is more alkalinity than hardness in water. Therefore, the pH of the water is generally going to be above seven. And in most, you know, municipal tap water sources, the pH is going to be somewhere between seven and a half and nine. That's just typical worldwide. Okay. The reason I don't want you paying too much attention to water pH is because you can have both a high mineral water source and a low mineral water source that has the same balance, has the same pH. But one is going to be much more, have a much stronger effect on mash pH than the other. I equate it to having, you know, two small children on a seesaw versus two 500 pound gorillas on the seesaw. You, the one, you know, the kids are easy to move, easy to change. The gorillas, not so much. 
Okay, so uh, pay attention to your mash pH because mash pH drives beer flavor, but not your water pH. Okay, and as I said, effect of beer pH on flavor. Um, in general, a lower beer pH focuses and brightens the malt and hop flavors. And this is very useful for your single malt beers such as Pilsner or Pale Ale, Munich Helles, uh, Kolsch, stuff like that, where you want a little lower pH to help make that, that singular malt character pop, you know, give it some brightness, give it some contrast, get some interplay between the malt and hops. Uh, in the case of a dark beer, however, when you lower the pH, you, t you are focusing the flavors and you tend to end up with kind of a singular roast character. It doesn't taste bad. It doesn't taste astringent or acrid necessarily, but it becomes more one dimensional as you lower the pH. Okay. So in general, a higher beer pH broadens and opens up the malt and hop flavors. And of course, this can be taken to extremes as well, but uh, a little higher beer pH is better for your multiple malt dark beers. Now you can taste the caramel malt, you can taste your roast malt, you can taste your smoked malt. They all kind of interplay together. Uh, and that, that does occur with a little bit higher beer pH. Pale beers with a higher beer pH though, tend to become, become dull they lose that, that malt brightness character, just like in the spaghetti sauce example, okay? So this is how beer pH affects perception of flavor. Seasoning balance, sulfite and chloride. Okay, uh, as I said, it is, you know, sulfate versus chloride, dryness versus fullness, hoppy versus malty. Um, the actual amounts are more important than the ratio, but the ratio is a good place to start. Um, and it's important to emphasize that 40 to 10, a very you know low mineral water, doesn't taste the same as 400 to 100 in you know, like a high mineral water. They're gonna take, they're gonna have different effects and have different flavors. Um, Useful range for uh, sulfate to chloride is probably like five to one to one half to one. That is one half to one being more chloride than sulfate. And that's typically what you would use with your hazy IPAs. Uh, maximum suggested sulfate is 500 ppm. Although that I find even 100 or 200 ppm of sulfate is generally enough, even for IPAs, West Coast IPAs. That's enough dryness and enough pop to the uh, hop character. Maximum suggested chloride is 200 ppm. Um, don't try to make a beer both malty and hoppy by increasing both because what you're going to end up with is, is a minerally tasting beer. All right. The TDS effect, uh, I call this mineral structure. And if you have the latest edition of How to Brew, the 2017 edition uh, with the yellow cover, um, I cover all this in there in, I think it's chapter 22 or 23. Okay. Anyway, light versus heavy seasoning. Look at these three beer styles, Bohemian Pilsner, German Pilsner, Dortmunder Export. You know, all European lager beers all have the same ingredients. Um, very similar recipes, but they are distinctly different styles. And one of the reasons for that difference is the water that they're made from. Bohemian Pilsner made with very soft, low mineral water. Um, total dissolved solids is only about 50 ppm. Total dissolved solids, of course, is the sum total of all the minerals that are in solution. So uh, if the TDS is 50, we're talking, you know, uh, concentrations of individual ions that are all like less than 10. So a very soft water. Um, and it makes a beer with soft flavors. Uh, there's not a lot of structure supporting those flavors, supporting that bitterness. It, all of your flavors become kind of soft. 
German Pilsner with a little higher TDS uh, and starts to put some edges on that beer. The beer becomes a little bit crisper and a little bit sweeter, um, getting some, some seasoning in other words. Dortmunder Export is actually a lighter beer than the other two, but it doesn't taste like it because the minerals in the water at 750 ppm total dissolved solids provide a lot more structure for those flavors, make it a more robust tasting and satisfying beer, even though the OG is a little bit lower. Okay, so this is the concept of mineral structure. Residual alkalinity, of course, um, it is the difference between the effects of total alkalinity and hardness on the mash pH. And there's the equation. Many of you, are, of course, are familiar with that. Um, so hardness, water hardness, calcium and magnesium react with malt phosphates when you, when you mash in. And as you can see in the equation here, Calcium combines with phosphate to produce calcium phosphate precipitate and two hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions are one of the mechanisms that lower the mash pH from the water pH down to our target mash pH of 5.2 to 5.6. There are other mechanisms at play as well. Um, different malts have different levels of uh, acidity uh, different buffer systems that all participate in this uh, in this melange, um, but this is one of them. Okay, so residual alkalinity is looking at what is the effect of hardness versus the effect of alkalinity in the water that buffers that reaction that that soaks up those hydrogen ions that are generated. Um, Alkalinity doesn't raise mash pH so much as it just inhibits its lowering, okay? And you can see here in this graph, this is a uh, water to grist ratio in, in uh, liters per kilogram, eight, six, four, and two. And you can see that as you increase the residual alkalinity of the water, it has a greater and greater effect on raising uh, mash pH. Okay, down here uh, with um, with a water to grist water to grist ratio of four liters per kilogram, which is a pretty typical ratio for most of us. We can see that the distilled water mash pH of base malt is about five point eight, and as you decrease the residual alkalinity, that comes down um, about a tenth, like five point seven. As you increase the residual alkalinity though, um, it easily pumps up to about six at these very high residual alkalinity numbers, okay? I would never recommend exceeding 100 or 150 ppm residual alkalinity as calcium carbonate because it, the alkalinity just gets too high this and the, the pH rise or the pH buffering gets too high. So you want to operate down in this, this range here. So mash pH, therefore, is the equilibrium between your water chemistry and your malt chemistry. Water chemistry is summarized by residual alkalinity. And malt chemistry is our next area of discussion. Your malts uh, are either alkaline or acidic relative to your target pH target pH being 5.2 to 5.6. Your base malts are generally alkaline. They have a distilled water mash pH of about 5.8. Your specialty malts, those have been kilned and roasted for color and flavor development, um, generating you know, red and yellow uh, colors and melanoidins and various flavor compounds. Those generally have a distilled water mash pH of less than 5.2, um, typically somewhere around the 4.6, 4.8 uh, region, okay? And as I'm discussing here, generally speaking, the darker the malt is, the lower the distilled water mash pH will be. However, when you move from kilning to roasting, 
you, when you move from yellow red melanoidins to brown melanoidins, color compounds, uh, what's actually happening is that you're pyrolyzing and breaking down these buffers that you know give it those colors. So therefore your dark caramel malts have a much higher acidity than your roast malts. Your most acidic malt is like a caramel 120 or a caramel 180 or a melanoidin malt uh, with a color of like 180 or 200. When you transition in color from around 200 uh, up to 300, this is where uh, this pyrolization and pol polymerization occurs and you start losing acidity. And so your dark malts uh, have higher color, but they have uh, less acidity than your darkest caramel malts. So your mash pH then, it helps to, under, to think about it conceptually as balancing a triangle. You've got your base malt alkalinity and times its weight as one quantity, your specialty malt acidity times its weight as another, and then finally your water's residual alkalinity times its volume as your third quantity. And these three things combine to determine your mash pH. So that's why I say it's like balancing a triangle. And it helps to think about this concept when you are planning your uh, water adjustments and your and your uh, your grain bill when developing a recipe, understanding that the water you know the water is going to play off of that grain bill uh, in this manner. Okay. So, what is the optimum mash pH? Well, it depends. Uh, because there are roughly 30 different enzyme groups that are uh, active in the mash at any one time, and each of them has its own optimum range. Uh, when we talk about optimum, we need to define what it is we're trying to optimize, what property we're trying to optimize. For example, the optimum for optimum proteolysis, protein breakdown, is lower than that for sacrification, starch breakdown. Um, so an optimum mash pH represents a compromise of all the different properties of that mash that we would try to measure. It's like herding cats. Um, but when, as brewers, we're generally focused on optimum yield, getting the most bang for our buck in terms of uh, extract yield and sugar from our mash, okay? Um, but different authors have different uh, opinions on what those, that optimum is. So here we have three uh, authors, uh, Briggs in Malting and Brewing Science. He measured um, 5.2 to 5.4 at mash temperature as being the optimum. This converts to about 5.45 to 5.65 at room temperature. Bamforth um, measured 5.3 to 5.8. And this equates to about five, five to six at room temperature. Kuntz in um, technology of malting and brewing says that it's uh, five, two, five to five, three, five at mash uh, temperature or five, five to five, six at room temperature. So if we take the union of all these uh, numbers, uh, we're coming out, you know, five, five, four to five, six, or maybe five, four to five, eight as this optimum range for yield. Um, but that's yield. That's not necessarily the best beer. Um, Coons talks about this and he says that, you know, better beer flavor is actually achieved with a little lower pH, better, better, you know, flavor stability and so on. Uh, and that's how we kind of come down to our five, two to five, six. Uh, range at 20 degrees C. So you look at this and you say, well, you know, which of these authors was the most correct? Well, they're all correct because this is all real data. And it helps to, if you think about it, to realize that barley is an agricultural product, okay? It is grown all over the world. And here we are looking at three different 
uh, experiments, three different tests conducted in different years on different continents uh, and with malts that kind of came from different maltsters. So all of these, all these variables all uh, combine to shift that optimum. So this is all real data and it helps us as brewers to understand that this is all real data, okay? Um, our optimum pH may vary batch to batch, barley lot to barley lot, okay? Um, barley is an agricultural product. It's not, it's not fixed, it's not a mineral, uh, it, it's moving. Okay. So how do we test pH? Well, um, you can buy a good uh, $100 pH meter from Amazon or various sources, and you want a pH meter that has a resolution of two decimal points, not one like you see there in the picture. Um, because we are interested in those tenths, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4. Um, therefore, we need two decimal places to know where we are re relative to 5.3, for example. Um, it's also important to know that every electrode, no matter how much money you pay for it, has a limited lifespan. Um, the electrodes in pH meters are typically a... Uh, semi-permeable gas, semi-permeable glass membrane that gradually fills up with the ions from the solutions that you're measuring. So it, what it does, a pH meter measures the voltage across that junction and it calibrates that to uh, pH. You put it in a pH four test solution, you put it in a pH seven test solution, it measures that voltage and calibrates it. That's how pH meters work. As that membrane slowly fills up over time, that just that physical difference that's measuring the voltage across gets smaller and smaller. It has to say that this delta V you know, that's smaller it now represents this pH range of four to seven. And that's why eventually you have to change your electrode. Okay, got it. pH meters have automatic temperature compensation, ATC, but what is this? Well, uh, like I say, you calibrate your pH meter every day when you go into the lab. You put it in pH 4, you put it in pH 7, boom, it is calibrated at room temperature. To measure a solution that's at a different temperature, the ATC in the meter adjusts its response based on that temperature difference to give you the real pH measurement at this temperature that's different from the calibration temperature. ATC keeps the meter calibrated, okay? It doesn't do anything to compensate or to tell you about the actual change of pH due to temperature in the solution, okay? And if you remember your chemistry from high school, um, you know, chemical activity changes with temperature. Um, the, the molecules vibrate faster, chemical activity changes, pH changes with temperature. And this is why uh, when it comes to brewing, we always measure our pHs at room temperature. We always state our pHs with respect to room temperature. Uh, because that way we're comparing apples to apples. Okay, if you're going to measure it and report it at a different temperature, fine. You've got to declare that so people know. Um, and everybody's probably heard that there's a little, there's a 0.3 difference between room temperature and mash temperature uh, in pH. So you're thinking, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just measure it at mash temperature um, and uh, I'll, then I'll adjust. Well, that, that's fine, for, except for two things. One, doing, measuring your uh, mash pH at mash temperature is harder on your pH meter, okay? Um, so your electrode doesn't last as long. Second, that number is based on pale lager worts, Pilsner wort, you know, not Russian Imperial Stout, not Porter, not, 
you know, a Munich Dunkel or, you know, there's, there's a lot of difference between different words, okay? Uh, different buffering compounds, different compositions. So um, that 0.3 is very much a general number. So again, this is why when we look at the ASBC methods of analysis or the EBC uh, standards of analysis, uh, they all specify measuring beer pH at room temperature and measuring work and mash pH at room temperature. And to do that, you take a sample from the mash in like a cup, pour it onto a shallow saucer, give it lots of surface area to help it cool down. Um, you'll see in professional breweries, there's a, there's a jar up there where they can water cool a, a sample real quickly and take the measurement near room temperature. It doesn't have to be exactly room temperature doesn't have to be exactly seven or 20 degrees C. It could be 25. But the point is if you've minimized that pH difference due to temperature. And so you get a better number. Okay, so I've said that already. Okay, our mash pH sets up the beer pH. And here I'm showing a progression of how pH changes uh, during the brewing process. So we start out, you know, in our mash with a, you know, somewhere in the range of 5.2 to 5.6. If you think back to that equation I showed you with the calcium reacting with phosphate, you know, if you have sufficient calcium in your water, uh, that reaction will continue throughout the mash. And so uh, by the end of the mash, your pH may have dropped another additional two tenths. Okay, so you could go from 5.2 to 5.6 down to 5.0 to 5.4, for example. Uh, now we move to the boil. And in the boil, as you know, uh, concentration is, is occurring, uh, evaporation is occurring, uh, precipitation of proteins, which are buffering compounds. Um, you're adding alpha acids from your hops. Lots is going on in the boil. And so pH tends to drop by about another three tenths during the boil. You get to fermentation, the yeast have a huge effect on pH. They are taking in amino acids, they're excreting organic acids um, and uh, fatty acids. They're, they're excreting protons, um, lots going on during fermentation. pH drops typically by about another half. So you can see this, this is the progression of how we get from our mash pH down to our final beer pH that's typically in the four to 4.6 range, depending on style and so on, okay? As a brewer, if you take pH measurements on during your process, you know, at the mash, at the boil, at fermentation and final beer, um, and record those, you have a running record of how this process is occurring. And anytime you take a measurement and you see that pH change, well, you know something in your process has changed and it should throw up a red flag to you to investigate that previous step and see what might have you know, gone differently, okay? Uh, monitoring pH is one of your best tools for brew to brew consistency, okay? So adjusting beer pH for flavor. Every beer has an optimum beer pH where its flavors, that beer's flavors are best expressed to your palate. Uh, this includes malt flavors and aromas, hop flavors and aromas, yeast flavors and aromas. If you're not tasting or smelling every ingredient that you put in, Either that ingredient is not needed or you're probably not at the optimum beer pH to best express those characters. Uh, and you could go back up to your mash, adjust the mash pH by one tenth up or down depending and let that change trickle through and see how that affects the beer pH. This is all part of dialing in a recipe. Uh, you know, many brewers say that they'll go through, you know, five, five uh, iterations before they nail a recipe and find, feel that it has the character that they were looking for. 
suggested mash pH guidelines. So going back to this concept of, you know, mash pH affecting wort pH affecting beer pH and beer pH affecting flavor, I recommend a mash pH of 5.2 to 5.4 target for your pale beers, 5.3 to 5.5 for your amber beers, and 5.4 to 5.6 for your dark beers. It's a small change, but it can have readily uh, apparent flavor impacts. Excuse me. The guys at Brewlosophy have done a number of water experiments over the years, and consistently, uh, this is these these kinds of changes are apparent in their uh, triangle tests, um, and and having significance. Okay. Again, water pH is not important. Don't adjust your water pH based on water pH. Do it based on the alkalinity. Okay. Now, here is the brew cube. And this is a tool I came up with uh, when I was trying to explain water to uh, a, a group of uh, Greek home brewers in Athens <laughs> a few years ago. Um, picture your Rubik's cube. And what we're doing, what I'm trying to show you is how these different water and style parameters fit together, how they correspond to one another. We're gonna define the beer style by three characters. Your beer flavor balance, multi-balanced or hoppy, your beer color, pale, amber, or dark, and your structure, soft, medium, or firm, okay? Um, and then those correspond to three water parameters, calcium levels, residual alkalinity, and sulfate to chloride ratio. So in the case of beer color, a pale beer color corresponds to a negative residual alkalinity, somewhere in the ballpark of negative 100, scaling up to zero. Zero corresponding to amber, plus 100, 100 corresponding to dark. Okay, and these are, these are guidelines, remember, please, guidelines. Um, not hard and fast rules. Beer flavor balance, multi, that corresponds to your half to one sulfate to chloride ratio. That is more chloride than sulfate. Hoppy, four to one, for example, more, more sulfate than chloride and balance being near one to one. Beer structure, soft, medium, or firm. This is your calcium level. Cal because we're adding calcium salts, your total dissolved solids is directly proportional to your calcium uh, uh, concentration. So soft, you want to get that 50 minimum calcium for good beer clarity, good yeast behavior, and so on. Um, medium structure, looking towards 100 ppm of calcium, firm up to 150. There, most beer styles are only are soft or medium. Not um, only I can only think of really two that are firm, and that would be um, Burton Ale and Dortmunder Export. Okay, those are your firm structure beers. Most everything else is uh, falls in the soft to medium uh, categories. Okay, so this is how I want you to understand water adjustment in terms of you, for what you need to do as a brewer. You know, you look at your source water, figure out how it falls. You know, is it a low mineral water? You know, 50, less than 50 ppm of calcium, uh, generally soft beer structure. Um, what is its sulfate to chloride ratio? Does it fall in that multi-balanced or hoppy area? Um, what is its residual alkalinity? Is it you know, better suited for pale, amber, dark beers? Looking at it from the other side, you want to brew a porter. Okay, that is a dark beer. You're looking for a water that has positive residual alkalinity. You're looking at a balanced sulfate to, to chloride ratio. You want something that has some dryness, but also has some maltiness. So you're looking for a one-to-one -one sulfate to chloride ratio. 
Um, and depending on the kind of porter that you like, you may be looking soft or medium, probably medium. You're looking for a little bit hardier porter, perhaps. Um, that drives your calcium level to 100, okay? So that's as deep as you need to get in planning water adjustment, okay? You don't have to match a particular brewing city. You just have to understand how these levers work. You know, what ballpark are you shooting for in terms of water composition to support and enhance the flavors of your beer? Um, I think, okay, here. So these are uh, examples of the, you know, the, these combinations, uh, pale, multi, balanced, soft, medium, firm, etc. Oops. Nuts. Okay, so for pale hoppy, you do one gram per gallon of calcium sulfate and a half gram per gallon of calcium chloride. That would give you this profile. Okay, negative residual alkalinity, not negative 100, but negative 70, which is in that direction. Your sulfate to chloride, 150 sulfate to 60 chloride, you know, that is a hoppy two to one uh, kind of profile. Balanced, you do equal amounts of each salt, and that gets you, you know, in a near balanced situation here with sulfate to chloride. 111 versus 96. Same general total calcium level, um, same general residual alkalinity. You go to amber, same calcium sulfate and calcium chloride additions, but now we're adding a half gram per gallon of baking soda, of sodium bicarbonate. And you can see that that changes our uh, carb bicarbonate uh, concentration and changes our residual alkalinity, everything else being the same. Dark uh, water profile, we increase that from a half to one gram per gallon, and you can see the resulting change in residual alkalinity here. Okay, those are simple water adjustments based on those uh, style parameters. And here are some mini mash results we did with those waters and three very simple grain bills. The grain bills were for pale was simply base malt, for amber, base plus 10% crystal, uh, crystal 60 as I recall, maybe it was 80, I forget. Uh, dark, uh, base plus the crystal plus 10% roast, okay. Um, water to grist ratio was four liters per kilogram. And you can see that, um, with the, the pale grist bill, just base malt only, as you increase the residual alkalinity of the water, the mash pH goes up. For you know, one water type, pale hoppy, as we increase the, uh, the gray, grain bill to, from pale amber to dark, you can see the pH come down, okay? So, and same way up here, dark multi, as we increase the, uh, the grain bill, adding the caramel and roast, you can see the pH come down. So pretty, you know, pretty consistent effects. So how do I adjust water for style when I'm going to brew a beer? This is my thought process. You know, I'm looking at the style characteristics of the beer I want to brew, pale amber or dark, flavor balance, structure. Okay, here's my water that I brew with here at home. 40 calcium, less than 50, um, high alkalinity, 120 ppm, falls in that high range, 100 to 150. Fairly balanced sulfate to chloride ratio, 40 to 35, and low concentrations, generally speaking. These are less than 50 ppm, same with the sodium. My residual alkalinity is positive at about 86, okay? With this water alone, this would drive me towards a soft flavored, soft structure, uh, amber, maybe dark amber ale. Uh, 
wouldn't have to change anything if I wanted to brew that, okay? But if I want to brew something else, such as a West Coast IPA, um, pale hoppy medium, um, well, I'm going to add more calcium and I'm going to bump that up to my target of 100 uh, for medium structure for West Coast IPA. So I'm going to add one gram per gallon of calcium sulfate and that takes me from these, these numbers down to these numbers. 100 calcium, magnesium is unchanged, alkalinity is unchanged, sulfate now is up at 187 versus 40. Chloride and sodium are unchanged. My residual alkalinity has dropped from 86 to 42. Okay, that's not negative, like my guideline with my cube would suggest, but it's workable. I could add some uh, caramel malts and make it an amber uh, IPA, and that would help offset this amount of residual alkalinity. But if I want to brew a pale one, uh, then I would need to do some acid additions to neutralize the alkalinity. And so based on my water app, I'm going to add uh, 0.75 milliliters per gallon of lactic acid to neutralize my total alkalinity from 120 down to 3. And that brings my residual alkalinity from 42 down to negative 75. Okay, so those are those are the steps that I would use in designing my water adjustments for this beer. So my final adjusted water, the way I'm going to work this in the actual brew is first I'm going to acidify it and re re neutralize that alkalinity first. Okay, uh, I'm going to pour that amount of acid in and uh, the bicarbonate is going to convert to dissolved carbon dioxide. I'm going to stir that water and get that carbon dioxide to fizz out, okay, come out of solution. That's how I, that's how I get rid of that carbonate is uh, converts to carbon dioxide and evolves from the water. Now with that lower pH, my calcium salts, particularly that gypsum, is going to dissolve better than it would uh, in, the, in the raw water. Um, the solubility of calcium sulfate is great. It's, uh, you can get like, I think it's two grams per liter into solution, except it dissolves very slowly and after much stirring. So acidify first, then add your calcium sulfate. Uh, it'll dissolve faster, okay? The next question I get is usually when do I add salts, okay? And everybody's system is different. Uh, as a home brewer, I'm adding all of my salts to the hot liquor tank. I'm adjusting all of my water ahead of time and then I just brew with it, okay? As a home brewer, that's very easy to do. In a commercial situation where you're having to, you know, adjust, you know, 10 times that amount of water, uh, you may do it different ways. You may have an instant hot water heater that heats the water in line and you're just filling up your mash tun with your mash volume. So in that case, you would be doing this acidification in the mash tun for that mash water volume. Same with adding your brewing salts. So in that case, I would again, I would fill up that mash tun with the water, uh, add the acid, do get that evolving CO2 out, then add your salts and then dough in, okay? Um, your first priority, of course, is, is always to achieve your mash pH target. That's your primary consideration. Once you've done that, now you can worry about maybe adding a little more sulfate or a little more chloride or whatever your condition is to enhance the beer flavor. That kind of addition can be done at the kettle after the mash. Um, okay, so uh, Guinness is a good example of this. Uh, Guinness Stout is done. They used to they used to have high carbonate water in 1750 when they first started brewing there. 
uh, and then they switched to canal water because um, they could pull more water from the canal uh, at a time, much easier, we didn't have to wait for it, but it was a completely different water. It was precipitation from granite hills to the south uh, that fed that canal. So a completely different water profile. So they changed their production to be a base malt only mash um, with a little, you know, some additions to get their mash pH right. Um, of course, they had pH didn't get invented till 1920. But, um, you know, in terms of understanding what they're tasting and how well this is working, uh, brewers were new about a water adjustment 100 years before pH. Okay, they really did. <laughs> um, they went to a base malt only mash and then steeped the roasted malt separately and combined them in the fermenter. Okay, and that's the way they brew it to this day. Um, and so achieve your, mar ma your mash target pH first, get that good extraction, that good yield, and then start worrying about flavors. Okay. Um, if, okay, so to summarize neutralizing alkalinity brew pale beers, look at your total, out total alkalinity, divide that by 50, and that will give you the number of milliequivalents per liter of alkalinity that's present. You can then specifically target that with an equal amount of acid. Um, so a one normal solution of acid contributes one milliequivalent per liter. So you would simply use you know, three milliequivalents per liter of this one normal solution of acid to neutralize this three milliequivalents per liter of alkalinity. That is acid adjustment right there. And I, I explain it better in the water book and in how to brew. Um, but that, that's all you have to do, okay? If you're adding alkalinity to brew dark beers, um, sodium bicarbonate works better than calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate was the old go-to. Um, it's chalk, it's readily available, but it turns out that the reaction kinetics are very slow. It can take two hours for a calcium carbonate addition to the mash to go through the chemical reactions to start moving the mash pH. Okay, and of course, after two hours, your mash is long done and it's done it at the wrong pH. Um, and uh, so use sodium bicarbonate or uh, say calcium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. Those will have a much faster effect on raising mash pH than calcium carbonate. Um, yeah. So there's some guidelines there in terms of, cal of um, sodium bicarbonate levels. Again, alkalinity is measured as calcium carbonate. That's the unit. Um, and I explain all that in how to brew and in the water book, how to convert. Uh, but those some guidelines there, 50 to 75 uh, PPM residual alkalinity for red and brown beers, um, 75 to 125 ppm is calcium carbonate residual alkalinity for brown to black. Okay. Adjusting sparge water. Again, target mash pH is your first priority. After that, the priority moves to preventing the rise of pH as you sparge. Because after you, if you start exceeding 5.8 and get, excuse me, getting into the 6.0 pH kind of thing, that's where you start extracting tannins and silicates from your grains. Okay, and that's where you start getting the stringency in your beers. So watch your runnings pH, monitor your runnings pH. If that pH starts rising, uh, then you want, may want to adjust your sparge water. If you have a low alkalinity water, such as a surface water source, you may not have to do much acidification of your sparge water. It may be fine as is. Um, if you have a groundwater source with relatively high alkalinity, you're going to want to adjust that uh, sparge water before you use it and, and neutralize that alkalinity. Again, 
do your acid additions, do your um, acidification based on the amount of alkalinity that's in the water, not on the water's pH. If you have a pH meter and they're able to keep you know, testing it as you do acid additions, uh, yeah, you can, you can do it that way, uh, but you've really got to monitor that pH. It's a lot easier to just calculate it out beforehand, add that specific amount of acid, be done with it, rather than trying to keep checking back and forth. Okay. Uh, sorry, I tend to belabor certain points. Um, okay. So in summary, we adjust our water to achieve good mash pH. We also, we also adjust our water to adjust the beer seasoning. And remember, brewing is cooking. So don't, you know, don't oversalt your beer, but don't be afraid to adjust your water in an, in an effort to enhance its flavor. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, John. That was uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much for the uh, really useful insight there into into water. Oh, good. Trevor, we got some good. questions, eh? Yeah, that is amazing. Thank you very much, John. That was uh, that was very very uh, very in depth uh, discussion of it, and I, th I think a lot of people are going to download that app because that that seems very helpful. It's also amazing how you dance between the empiric and the uh, kind of metric system with your oh. milliliters <laughs> per gallon. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's very uh, politically correct yeah uh leaders leaders are great but uh gallons are kind of easier <laughs> from our point of view <laughs> what's an american gallon is about 4.5 liters isn't it uh 3.8 3.8 okay yeah okay all right mike you want to start with some of the questions yeah, so there was, uh, let's, let's go, I'm going to go backwards just to really annoy your system, Trevor. But um, just to clarify a point you've just <laughs> made um, from Cam, he says, did he understand correctly that you must get the pH right for the mash and then you can fix the salts for the boil? Um, it makes a lot of sense, but he's never thought of it that way before. Um, in terms of priority, yes. But often you're doing these things simultaneously. If you look back at the, the slides where I was adjusting my water, you know, I was planning that out, you know, by looking at, you know, my saying, I'm going to do this West Coast IPA. I'm going to get my calcium level up to 100 as my first step. What does that do to my residual alkalinity? And then looking at that residual alkalinity and say, okay, what's the next step? I've got to, I want to bring that down further. And so I'm going to add acid. <laughs> When it comes to actually brewing the beer, I do the acid addition first, the salt addition after that. And like I said, when I brew as a home brewer, I'm able to adjust my entire water volume in my hot liquor tank at the beginning. I don't have, then I don't have to worry about any other adjustments from there on out. If you're in a situation where you, where you can't do that, then maybe you would acidify first and then worry about salt additions later in the kettle. Okay, lots of options there. And that's, that's what I was trying to allude to. And I, th I hope that answers this question. Perfect, yeah. And then also talking about acidifying, um, a lot of guys use um, acidulated malt here to adjust yep. the pH. Um, so then, you know, how, how does that affect the, uh, the process? Wireman says that uh, it 1% of in, in the grain bill, 1% of acidulated malt in the grain bill reduces mash pH by about one tenth. So, you know, let's say with uh, your, your gris bill without the acidulated malt, you get a pH of 5.7. Maybe you want to bring that down to 5.4. You would add 3% by weight of acidulated malt in place of 3% of your base malt because acidulated malt is base malt that's just been soaked in sour wort. Yeah. Okay. And obviously then you'd have to adjust your sparge water or you might have to adjust your sparge water with, uh, with some acid. Mm. Depending yeah. On you the, might have yeah. to do that. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Adam. I think, I hope that answers Paul and Julian, Paul and Julian's question, Julian from uh, beer boot camp. Uh, a question here from Brewer Pinheiro. 
due to malts being different and constantly changing, would you recommend titration to determine the exact amount of lactic or phosphoric acid to add to the mash in order to adjust mash pH? You can. Um, that you know that is a very much a nerd brewer kind of thing to do. Uh, <laughs> I I endorse it, but you know really it's probably more practical to simply uh, make up a mini mash and measure the pH of it, and then maybe you know add add proportional drops of acid or change your change up your grist bill a little bit, you know to determine uh, how much water adjustment you need that way. Um, titration of a malt is great from an academic or you know like a very large brewery's point of view um like say sierra nevada or somebody like that you know they would they would have the time uh, to 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 do that sort of thing um it's like i say it's probably faster just to do a mini mash and see what you get um what was i gonna i was gonna say something else what was it uh, it'll sorry. come back. Yeah, it'll come back. <laughs> yeah. So, that, so, so another question then from Cam uh, was: Is there such a thing as a best general water profile, profile, one that would work well for most styles? And he also adds, um, so that beginner brewers don't have to work out a set of additions each time. The water here um, is quite consistent, or especially in Cape Town, uh, all the minerality is quite is quite low to start with. So um, yeah, is there something, is there something you can suggest to new brewers as a, as a go-to yeah. starting point? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. And um, one gram per gallon of either calcium sulfate or calcium chloride will generally get you 90% of the way there. Calcium, calcium sulfate for your hoppy beers, calcium chloride for your malty beers. If you're trying to brew um, a good Bohemian Pilsner, do that one gram per gallon of calcium chloride. That will get your calcium up to about 70 ppm. Um, it'll get the chloride up to about 100, 120, which is you know a useful concentration to enhance that maltiness. Um, and you know your sulfur sulfate may be low um, and you may decide that you want to add some sulfate as well to try to kind of to get that beer a little bit crisper um, yeah so and then you so you can play with those those uh those gypsum and, and calcium chloride additions uh varying them like i do in that one chart you know the pale hoppy pale balance pale malty um, that that's a very good general uh, way to look at water adjustment is first step is get that calcium up and then you can start looking at alkalinity and, and so on from there. Perfect. Got a question here from uh, the Tuscany. They, they say uh, when you use a grain basket, should you use the volume of the basket or the amount of water in the vessel to calculate your mash density? uh amount of water in the vessel i think yeah you know yeah I, makes that makes sense yeah yeah you want you want your total water to grist ratio um i you know and i guess if you look at some of the false bottom systems um like i'm i'm like i said earlier i'm bre currently brewing on an anvil foundry uh all in one systems kind of like the the what do you call it the grain father yeah. um there's a considerable uh, space between the bottom of the unit where the heating element is and the bottom of the grain basket you know there's like two inches there um, so your water to grist ratio may be you know four liters per kilogram but within the grain basket you may be at a really a relatively higher concentration because you know that grain has been condensed into a smaller area and it's and it's effectively seeing a, a higher, uh, or sorry, a lower water to grist ratio. Perfect. So then another question from Sis here is: Is there a ratio of where the process water adjustments um, has the biggest impact? For instance, using DME or 
liquid malt extract to brew with um, means the mash has already been done by someone else. How does adjusting the water impact the process further down the line, fermentation and onwards? Yeah, if you're using malt extract, as you say, the mash has already been done, the mineral additions have already been done. Uh, you um, should only be adding, I think, low mineral water to brew with extract because there's already going to be lots of mineral in the extract itself. Um, so yeah, low mineral waters for extract brewing. Um, if after brewing that particular recipe, you think that you know some additional sulfate would help things or some additional chloride, then you could try adding more salts uh, to the brew kettle as you're brewing with it. Um, but, you know, I think the first step is always do use a low mineral water with extract to start with. Okay. I got, I've got a question. I just, um, the, the... okay. okay. <laughs> <Go for> it, <laughs> I think it's probably the last one. Um, so I've heard that use that dry hopping can increase um, pH. pH in the final beer. Yeah. Um, yes. And I know some brewers do adjust the pH back down with, uh, say, lactic acid, for instance. Is that something mm -hmm. you've had a lot of experience with? Then, obviously, it sounds like it is. Um, well, I, I've had a lot of experience with other people uh, doing it um, and talking with them about it. Yeah, um, yeah, dry hopping definitely has a, a big effect on beer pH. It will raise it from you know four point two up to four point seven. 4.8 even pretty easily uh yeah. especially with with the hazy ipas where you're you know you're doing wow. you know um you know two pounds per barrel kind of hopping rates or what's that equate yeah. to that's uh, like eight grams per liter of yeah. hopping rate um so um yeah i think especially in the kit let's let's talk about hazy ipa for a second in particular here is a style where we want a soft bitterness. We want to bring out the juicy character of the hops. We want to experience their aroma and flavor contributions. Um, you know, and when we say juicy, you know, uh, what, it, what, what are the characteristics of juice? Well, generally juices are a acidic, uh, drink, you know, um, solution. Um, there is, um, a you know, you get some hints of acidity. Um, there's some sweetness. So that's why when it comes to a hazy IPA, we want to bring that pH down a little bit because it enhances that, that juicy character. Uh, we also want to decrease the bitterness because that, again, that enhances that that perception of juiciness. Um, and so the brewing process for hazy IPAs is, you know, all late edition hops, um, you know, to minimize their bitterness contributions from isomerized alpha acids. Um, but when we do that, we end up raising pH because of the dry hopping. So yes, adding some additional acid, either phosphoric or lactic to after the fermentation uh, to counteract or even during fermentation to counteract the dry hopping uh, rise uh, will result in a tastier hazy IPA. But yeah, you, you have to do it judiciously and, and trial and error and get that just right. You got to dial it in. Yeah, that, that was kind of my next question was, uh, you know, in, in the later stages of fermentation, if you see, if you don't see your pH coming down, do you ever start fiddling? But but you've answered that. You 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 will add add acids if you if you see it's appropriate. Uh, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And you know, and brewing, especially pro professional brewing, is a is an iterative process where you're gonna you're gonna make tweaks, you know, from this brew to the next brew to the next week, next month, when you'd brew that beer again, uh, you know, and finding that that sweet spot. Um, Whereas on a, at a homebrew level, you're trying to you're trying to do everything the first time because you're going to brew something completely different next time. <laughs> um, so it makes it a little trickier to predict. I, need, 
Interesting question that's just come through here, actually, that uh, does come up quite often. Lactic or phosphoric acid? Which one is? Which one do you prefer? I prefer lactic um, for two reasons. One, um, there is the calcium phosphate precipitation uh, situation with phosphoric acid, and I explain this in Appendix B of the Water Book. Um, essentially, adding a whole bunch of phosphate to the system encourages the precipitation of calcium phosphate and can take all your calcium additions out of solution. Right. Um, lots of variables associated with that. No, we can't go into it, but it's, it's there in Appendix B. Also, I think lactic is a beery flavor, if you will. I mean, yeah. it's a natural beery flavor. Um, so I kind of prefer lactic for that reason. One, I think it's more natural. Two, it doesn't have that annoying calcium problem. However, if you go to the Brewlosophy website, they did an experiment on this very thing. And their triangle tests with one beer, you know, one half of the wort acidified with phosphoric and the other half acidified with lactic. And their tasting panel, uh, people overwhelmingly preferred the phosphoric beer wow. to the lactic, even though the, I, the anion concentrations were, you know, below threshold. They felt that they preferred the phosphoric overwhelmingly. <laughs> Amazing. So there you go. Any questions? I've missed, uh, there's an, another late question from uh, our Yorkshire friend, uh, David. How would adding fruit like mango, for example, affect the pH of the beer? I would imagine it would raise it, but uh, let's hear. Drop it. Drop it. Uh, it, it would it would probably drop it. I think the natural pH of mango is somewhere around like 4.8. So depending on how much you add, it may have some lowering effect or it may not change it. Again, you know, pH change is a function of the buffering capacity of all the elements in the solution. Um, buffering is the essentially the resistance to pH change. So, you know, um, you know, I never brew with mango, uh, so I hate mangoes. So um, I'm not, I can't, I can't say from personal experience what the effect would be other than make beer taste yucky. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, like, I like, I like, I like mangoes. I'll stick up for mangoes. I, I, okay. I like, I'm also a mango fan. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, I hate yeah. mosaic. It's like a mosaic hop. Blah, blah. <laughs> that's, like every, that's like every beer, isn't it? Mosaic. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Give me Cascade. Well, I love one, Cascade. Anyway. <laughs> Can we just squeeze in one more question from, uh, from uh, the Eastern Cape, Andrew Slater? How much of an impact does the water to grist ratio make on the quality of the final beer? Not much. Water to grist ratio is a factor in many brewing processes, but it is a small factor. You know, it's that, it's that 5% effect, you know. Um, water to grist ratio is a useful tool to understand, you know, in terms of hitting your numbers for, for gravity and so on. Um, and, Maybe I didn't say this well in the slides, but if you remember that multicolored uh, graph of the effect of residual alkalinity, the higher water to grist ratio you have, the more uh, effect residual alkalinity has on the pH, generally raising it higher and higher um, with greater and greater water to grist ratios. The more water, therefore, you know, the more water, the more effect that water chemistry has on mash pH. So um, traditional, ma uh, traditional mash water to grist ratios are in the two uh, liters per kilogram to four liters per kilogram kind of range. Depending on the brew system, you may end up with a water to grist ratio of um, five or even six liters per kilogram, depending on specific system. And it doesn't really impact the flavor mouthfeel of you know the quality of the beer so much um you, you wouldn't often 
uh, perceive that. Perfect, John. That's that's great. That so I think we're gonna we're gonna call it a day there. That was um, okay. That was awesome. Unless if I missed something, Trevor, you you look, look like you want. We, to we just had, we just had an we had just an amazing feedback, John. So uh, you maybe didn't see it on the YouTube channel, but the the questions were firing up and great attendance. So this was oh, good, really good. great. It continues to inspire, and uh, people are very grateful. And uh, you're a hero down mm. here. I actually did well, meet you. you, as I said. So yeah. we, we hope to see you when you come down for the beer boot camp. Uh, hopefully yeah. when all of this craziness ends. Next year, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Even in a mask, John. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Even. All right. And, and thank well, you. Thank you very much for your generosity. You're very welcome. I was very, gl very glad to do it. Very glad. Good to see you all. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank thanks. You. Thanks well, for tuning in, folks, as well. Um, as I said, massive thanks to John for taking the time to give us such a great presentation. Water chemistry is an area that I'm always trying to tweak um, and one that I think can make quite a big difference to the beer. So that was very informative. Tune in again tomorrow when I'll be chatting to Neil from RHBC, Nick from Drifter, Bruce from Stellies, and Fraser from Fraser's Forry. Until then, cheers, guys.